Well, let's get things rolling. Season two, episode 27. Enjoy. My guest today is Dr. Wesley Kephart, assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. Dr. Kephart obtained his PhD from Auburn University, where the majority of his research centered on supplementation in the ketogenic diet. He currently has 30 published manuscripts and once held an American record as a raw powerlifter in 2014. Wes, thanks so much for taking the time today. Oh, hey, thank you for having me, man. Terrific. Well, uh, maybe you can start the conversation here by telling listeners a little bit more about yourself, your background, and how you got into this area of research. Oh, yeah. Well, so, gosh, I've kind of been into carbohydrate restriction and uh, uh, ketogenic stuff for a pretty long time. Uh, Dr. Atkins wrote uh, The New Diet Revolution, like I, I don't even remember what year that was. For sure. But <laughs> <laughs> it it was very interesting to me to read it because he said essentially the food guide pyramid to uh, flip it on its head. And I, I don't know why that resonated with me so much that just the idea of if everyone else is doing it, it must be wrong. And <clears throat> so his, his idea of focusing on uh, oils, fats, all, all of those different uh, uh, types of things, you know, um, it, it, it made a lot of sense. And uh, then going further into it, understanding how few carbohydrates we have in our body at any given time. Well, uh, say, for example, in your bloodstream, five, 10 grams of glucose approximately. And uh, so if you eat 20 grams of carbohydrate, sugar, whatever, that that's uh, it's a uh, it's a relevant physiological like stress that your body has to deal with. And that um, uh, was always interesting to me how we could do it. Uh, so I was, I was pretty young whenever I got into that. I, I was uh, uh, kind of intermittently on a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. I mean, obviously I would um, uh, eat like uh, cake on my birthday or like eat ice cream sometimes and uh, stuff like that. For but, sure. Yeah. Keep yeah, it balanced. You know. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, but I was also a vegetarian most of the time. So I've, I've been, a, or I, I had been a vegetarian for about uh, 12 years. And just for your listeners to be more specific, I guess, I was a, uh, a lacto-ovo vegetarian. So I consumed eggs and dairy and things. So n- not not too hardcore on uh, the vegan end of the spectrum. Yep. Um, uh, which uh, it, it was it was fun, it, it, like uh, doing the ketogenic uh, low carb stuff and uh, uh, not eating meat was that, that, that was pretty difficult for a few years. And I'm from uh, I'm from Texas initially, so uh, that's uh, kind of why they kicked me out. Wow, um, I was gonna say that's that's challenging. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. And uh, like uh, then going to Alabama and uh, yeah, no, that was uh, that was pretty intense. Um, uh, that, uh, not really like uh, uh, Southern hospitality. Everyone was pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> but I, uh, I've, I've also, uh, uh, power lifted for a pretty long period of time. I, uh, uh, I, like you said, I had a few, uh, American records in it for a bit. Um, uh, n- now granted it was a small person weight class. It was, uh, back whenever the USAPL had like 67 and a half kilograms. So I weighed like 148 or so. And, uh, w- which I mean, uh, uh, no one really cares about anybody that's under 200 pounds, to be honest. But it's, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think any any American record powerlifting is uh, pretty impressive. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, it was it, it was fun, and I uh, I actually did all that um, uh, on on a ketogenic diet, and um, it's uh, really if I hadn't have done that or uh, done some kind of manipulation with fasting, then it would be. Uh, keeping my weight down would have been very hard. And that, now, now, granted, I am a very uh, short human being, uh, 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 troll-like in stature. Mixing up like intermittent fasting and like keeping the carbohydrates extremely low made it uh, very easy to stay at a pretty low body weight. And whenever you're powerlifting, uh, you don't really do it much more than a rep or so. So you don't really even need glycogen to do it. It's um, absolutely uh, yeah. So that was pretty fun. And um, on the other end of the spectrum, I've ran a few unsanctioned. Uh, uh, ultra marathons. Um, and, uh, whenever I'm saying that, I mean, uh, like I would just set out a course for myself, put a camel pack on and I'd go run like 40 miles or so. Wow. And, uh, yeah, well, well uh, that was, um, uh, I, I was interested in that because well, well, I, I teach exercise physiology and, uh, uh, I, I was always kind of, it was easier for me to do more on the anaerobic or powering of the spectrum. 
uh, and uh, obviously coming from Texas, uh, uh, football was religion. So I played that. Um, of yeah. course, hundred percent. Nice. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, but on, on the other end of the spectrum, the more endurance type stuff, I never really experienced too much of that. And, um, I, I like, I'm not going to lie. I wasn't gifted at it, uh, much if at all. Uh, the, the, uh, whenever I ran 40 miles, it took me like eight hours to do. Um, oh, nice. Uh, so I like, yeah, it, it was, um, uh, yeah, I believe that's the farthest I ever ran. Uh, but interestingly, I, um, I, I could run 30 miles at a clip without, um, without eating anything. So I, I, I think that had quite a bit to do with, uh, kind of the low carbohydrate, like bad adapted nature of, uh, just really how I lived, you know? Um, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. And I mean, definitely want to circle back and dive into some of the nuance being obviously ketogenic for over a decade, you mentioned, and, and factoring in that vegetarian side, um, First, maybe let me jump into the uh, the recent uh, study pilot study that you published there on the three month effects of a ketogenic diet on body composition, blood parameters, and performance metrics in CrossFit trainees. So, maybe even before jumping into the uh, the setup of the study and the findings, can you maybe give listeners a little bit of the uh, terrain in terms of what what the mainstream is saying in this area of, of research? Um, uh, in this area of ketogenic diets and, and training and then what the research actually said before you guys jumped into to performing uh, the study oh yeah for, for sure well uh, uh yeah with um uh, with a ketogenic diet and, and uh, uh crossfit together we were trying to really put as many fitness buzzwords as we possibly could in it so it's nice. uh, you know, mission accomplished like, well done yeah, uh, uh, maybe we could have fit in like detox or functional training or something but you know exactly yeah uh but it 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 seems like the current understanding, um, uh, at least in the scientific literature, is that ingesting carbohydrates are necessary to uh, these more anaerobic type performances. Uh, uh, Jeff Volick has done a lot of really great stuff illustrating that on the uh, more endurance end of the spectrum, that the ketogenic stuff um, burning a whole lot more fat and uh, really almost not even burning that, that much glycogen uh, seems to be pretty beneficial on that end of the spectrum. And uh, uh, Paoli, and I, I can't remember what year it was, he, uh, he was looking at kind of male artistic gymnasts um, on the other end of the spectrum, which, you know, like a gymnastic relatively explosive sport. Uh, sure. I didn't, I didn't find any, um, uh, like, uh, neg- negative augmentations there. Uh, <clears throat> but... CrossFit ha- is interesting in the fact that it spends a lot of time kind of in this middle, very, uh, like, uh, burning zone. Uh, uh, it's where you develop a lot of lactic acid, and it's, uh, uh, well, I, I, I'm sure your listeners uh, are, are aware of many of the CrossFit wads where you just essentially go until you try to, well, you're trying to kill yourself, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Heavy glycolytic. Oh, yeah. Work capacity, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and it, it seems that, um, uh, well, a, a, at least uh, the conventional thinking is that um, uh, consuming carbohydrates is uh, like uh, necessary um, for those endeavors, and uh, uh, it, well, it, it it might not be. Uh, you, you know, it's uh, we have some ideas of uh, the amount of glycogen that. Um, like ultra endurance athletes, well, uh, going back to Volick, uh, that their muscle glycogen really wasn't any different. And um, in uh, rodent studies published out of our lab, uh, we put rats on a ketogenic diet and other rats on, uh, you know, like a higher carbohydrate diet that would, uh, uh, the ratios would be uh, more uh, normal to like, say what the USDA recommends or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't find any uh, glycogen differences either. So, uh, Potentially in the recovery periods, the uh, uh, ability for gluconeogenesis or um, uh, really maybe not even accessing that much uh, glycogen seems to uh, – that, that can probably uh, keep us together for uh, uh, these different types of events for uh, – as long as we're not, I don't know, running 800-meter dashes every hour on the hour, I guess. so. For sure. So that's definitely the conventional thoughts of, you know, loss of muscle mass, lower glycogen status, poor performance, always things that are cited. So can you maybe jump into uh, the study design and walk us through how you guys set up the study? Oh, yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Um, so 
how it was, there, there was a, uh, a CrossFit gym near us um, in, uh, at Auburn University that uh, contacted us. They, they knew we had some expertise in the ketogenic diet, and they really wanted to uh, have different groups of people uh, either uh, be on the ketogenic diet or um, uh, just follow their uh, standard diet and me- measure as many things as we possibly could to see uh, what, uh, over the course of 12 weeks, what, what occurred. So we uh, brought them in, uh, tested them on a bunch of metrics uh, uh, related to blood, so fasting glucose, uh, uh, cholesterol, triglycerides, all of that stuff. We also looked at their uh, maximum like uh, aerobic capacity, so kind of like a VO2 max or VO2 peak technically. Um, and uh, really what was the most fascinating stuff to me, what, what I really wanted to look at was uh, max strength numbers, so uh, say um, uh, a squat, and uh, like there hasn't been much uh, research on say explosive power, how that could potentially um, uh, uh, be um, like altered being on a ketogenic diet. And we also had them run a 400 meter dash, which you know just uh, uh, purely glycolytic right there. And sure. uh, uh, so we we tested them at the beginning. Uh, b- before they began uh, any of their um, uh, differential like dietary behavior. Uh, we tested them, I believe it was uh, about two weeks in, again, to more or less, uh, well, the test the whole idea of like the, the keto flu, if you've heard of that. Mm-hmm, for sure. Um, <clears throat> to see what's what's happening there. Because, uh, well, I, I believe uh, Tim Noakes uh, found that a- after about – Two or four weeks that, like, say, peak power on a wind gate went down. Uh, so uh, uh, we were interested in that. And then we wanted to test them again at the very end of the study, uh, what, like 12 weeks in. And uh, weekly I would meet up with them and I would test their um, uh, circulating levels beta, or uh, one of the ketone, uh, ketone bodies to uh, well, really make sure that they're following their diet. So that was uh, absolutely adherence is so key, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, and that's uh, I, that, that's basically what we did. It's um, uh, we allowed them to do their own programming, so uh, the different groups didn't get like uh, really awesome CrossFit programming, and the other one would get uh, just I don't know, like whatever's on like um, uh, CrossFit dot com or whatever. Uh, so it's uh, it, it was all within the box to use their terminology programming that everyone was experiencing the same thing. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's, um, well, and, and obviously we didn't, uh, double blind placebo control it because, well, uh, people know that they're not getting donuts. So it's, um, for sure. Uh, Tough to do. Yeah. Right. And so what, right. what instructions uh, were the participants given then on the nutrition front in terms of, you know, the keto group versus the control the keto group was given some general guidelines or how did that play out? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, pretty much the instruction on that were, um, Little presentations from uh, um, uh, the, the head of the lab at um, Auburn University, uh, Mike Roberts, a uh, super cool guy, if you ever could get him on. Um, uh, we showed them uh, kind of the art and science of, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on uh, Jeff Wolk and Steve Henney's book name, uh, Art and Science of Low-Carb Dieting, is, is, yeah. is that the name of it? Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's... Um, that's really what we stuck to, uh, uh, keeping carbohydrates below 50 grams per day. And, you know, wherever the carbohydrates are coming from, like uh, five or so from protein-ish sources, this many from nuts, this many from uh, 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 vegetables, this many from, you know, like like eating a berry or two. Um, uh, <clears throat> that, that That's really what we instructed them there. And the uh, control group, we told them, hey, just keep on doing what you're doing. And, um, easy for them, right? Perfect. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, really I, um, uh, the, the people on the, in, in the ketogenic group, they all pretty much stayed in ketosis the whole time, uh, over 0.5 millimolar of it. So it's, they, uh, regardless of what they were eating, they were restricting carbohydrates enough for me. So <laughs> terrific. And then you know, on the result side of things, I'm sure everyone's wondering after 12 weeks, you know, what, what happened here? Do we see any performance decrements in the keto group? How did things fare, um, in terms of the lifts, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what was really cool, both at, um, uh, the second time period, uh, so, so the, the two weeks or so in, 
And uh, at, at the end of the study, we didn't see any performance uh, decrements anywhere. So uh, that really the, the biggest finding um, from our study, I, I guess, would be uh, that the people in the ketogenic group, they um, uh, essentially lost exclusively body fat over the course of the study. Um, so it, they lost body fat, maintained their uh, uh, squat matches, their power cleans, their uh, 400 meter dash didn't get any uh, better or worse. Um, their VO2 peak didn't change. Um, uh, th there was a, a, a slight tendency to we measured uh, one of their quadricep muscles um, that that might have gotten a little bit smaller. Uh, and and um, uh, I, but I, I don't think that that really has much to do with anything because, well, they move the same weights in terms of squat. So I, th that could be a, a fluid shift artifact going on there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess in terms of the blood metrics that we uh, uh, saw, uh, LDL cholesterol did go up um, uh, a, a little bit for the ketogenic group, which is uh, relatively commonplace. But I, I, I don't know how much uh, your audience knows about um, uh, the controversies about uh, cholesterol and how much that actually indicates risk of, say, heart disease or anything. For sure, yeah. I mean, it's obviously widely debatable about LDL being, you know, is it a good surrogate marker for cardiovascular disease health? We tend to see now it is perhaps uh, not nearly as good as it's uh, the amount of emphasis that's been given, but it is interesting to find that that's, uh, that was something that you guys, a trend that you saw as well in, in, in your study, correct? Yes, 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 we certainly did. We certainly did. And uh, granted, the limitation there is we, we didn't measure um, uh, LDL particle size or the pattern B or pattern A type. So it's, um, uh, I, I can't speak too much about what's really going on there. But it's, uh, uh, in terms of their functional capacities, everything seemed to go really well for them. So I, 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 I was pretty happy about that, uh, especially the uh, power clean and the 400 meter dash were ones that I, uh, I, I haven't seen replicated enough in uh, current research that um, uh, I was interested in. Terrific. And it seems like obviously, you know, kind of moderate to advanced recreational athletes, they're maintaining performance or improving body composition. So that seems like an area where if people are looking for those uh, goals, it can be potentially a nice uh, nutritional strategy. Um, of course, in your study as well, you talk about, you know, they didn't experience any performance uh, gains necessarily or the improvements that the controls uh, might have experienced. Can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, well, really, I uh, just going back through the study, I uh, uh, at least re recalling the statistics, it didn't seem like anybody really panned out of having like a differential effect of like, say, the control group got uh, better at squatting uh, and the uh, keto group just the same. It's um, uh, yeah, the, uh, all, all that seemed to uh, really wash out in the uh, statistics, more or less. That um, uh, really o overall, both groups uh, maintained whatever uh, physical fitness status that they had. Just the uh, uh, ketogenic group um, uh, at at the end of the study had a couple pounds of less fat at the end. But, gotcha. um, yeah, yeah. And what are some of the other maybe limitations or factors to consider for folks who are you know, reading the study, trying to interpret the study and uh, to fit into the clients and the people that they see? Oh, yeah. Well, um, so first off is that there's a pretty small amount of people in uh, both groups. So it's, uh, uh, and, and uh, the, the title of it, it's a pilot study. Uh, it certainly needs more replication. And, uh, and also, I think taking it a little bit longer um, rather than uh, 12 weeks, let's do six months, let's do a year, something like that. Uh, I, I think would be uh, better at painting the landscape of what really happens over the uh, course of uh, uh, kind of keto adaptation. Um, so yeah, the, the, the limitations there, um, uh, kind of small sample sizes on both ends. Uh, and also it's uh, not like um, uh, these are rock star athletes or anything. So uh Physiology might be subtly different, and uh, I, I don't know someone that's actually going to the CrossFit Games or performs well at uh, CrossFit regionals. Um, uh, but for uh, people who recreationally just uh, go their uh, uh, 
uh, CrossFit box every so often, like a couple of times a week, it, it, it seems like it can uh, speak to them quite a bit. Um, Terrific. And, well, yeah, yeah. And in terms of, uh, you know, if we kind of circle back a little bit to your experiences over the years, um, you know, maybe initially coming into it or as you were getting into more intense, let's, you know, more intense training blocks, are there some strategies that you would use or you found helpful um, that in terms of changing fueling or making adjustments that would help to provide you with the ability to really maintain that work capacity as well as uh, limiting any of the potential uh, negative effects? Oh, yeah. Um, gosh, I'd, I, I guess in terms of... Well, well, if if I'm being honest, at the beginning of doing this, uh, you might just have to feel a little bad, and then after a while, it uh, more or less goes away. The, uh, the human body is so amazing to me and what it can adapt to. Um, so, I'd. Do you find that sorry to jump in? Do you find that more like a two week, a four week, for some people even longer, and kind of this? six, eight, 12 weeks. Is there a, a, a overarching theme you found over the years? Oh yeah. Well, so particularly in, uh, uh this study, I, uh, since I went there to, uh, test their, uh, blood ketones every week, I, I, I got to talk to them uh, a fair bit about like how they were feeling. And it did seem about four weeks that there were no more complaints from the uh, ketogenic group, but it does seem widely variable how people adapt to it. It's, uh, if, if we go back into like the um, uh, epilepsy research from Johns Hopkins, they would more or less get them uh, get get uh, kids with uh, intractable epilepsy keto adapted in three days or so if, through um, uh, a given like fasting protocol. So I I think you can get keto adapted relatively quickly if you're willing to uh, uh, fast for longer periods of time, have like pretty extreme carbohydrate restrictions, and also, if you're uh, upping your physical activity a fair bit, to really make sure that um, uh, your liver just doesn't have any glycogen in it. For sure. <laughs> I, I, I think that ushers in at least um, adaptation uh, s- somewhat better. Terrific. And, and, you know, for yourself, as you're getting through uh, intense training periods as well, or even just that adaptation period, in terms of, you know, electrolytes, salts, or there's certain um, protocols or or doses um, that you would lean on to help you in, in terms of how you felt? or Yes, yes. Oh, God. I, I'm very glad you said that about electrolytes because I almost forgot. Um, uh, no, well, if if you're uh, like salt or sodium phobic, then it's, it's going to be a rough time for you. Because um, uh, c- there are quite a few renal adaptations from uh, uh, restricting carbohydrates that uh, you, you tend to excrete more um, uh, electrolytes, sodium in particular. And if you aren't somewhat heavily salting your food, you might feel terrible. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah, like uh, up in, the, you know, sodium chloride or table salt, right? And uh, uh, ensuring that you get enough magnesium. That, that was one thing that I found to be kind of strange is uh, whenever I was getting into it, uh, at night, I would almost twitch a little bit, uh, like get little uh, mini uh, like muscle cramps uh, all over. If I didn't pay attention to uh, different foods that have uh, higher amounts of magnesium in them. So um, I, uh, one of the ones I, I leaned on quite a bit, being a vegetarian at the time, trying to get some protein in, was, uh, was almonds. Almonds are pretty high in uh, magnesium. So if if I ate enough of those without getting, you know, the carbohydrates too high, then it did seem to uh, kind of ameliorate any um, uh, twitchiness that I would get. So, yeah, it seems quite common, and definitely, uh, as you mentioned, being you know pretty liberal to almost aggressive with the salting and sea salts, and of course, magnesium-rich foods. You know, you mentioned the almonds, whether it's fish, leafy greens, avocados; those are all you know great oh, yeah. recommendations. And you know, Doc, how do we kind of get into as we get into sort of the nuance and the context and and keep people focused on this idea of maintaining performance improving body composition and sort of recreational crossfitters in the study and then you know if we look at more on the elite end you know louis burke's study in the the race walkers in terms of some of the performance outputs there um how important is kind of context in this and, and being able to as you mentioned before if we get athletes that are 
now starting to trend up towards that elite level, uh, you know, this idea of kind of fueling for the work required or, or getting the right amount of uh, fuel in, depending on the type of session, how, where, where does that start to become more important? Well, so I, I think if we're talking about um, uh, on up towards the very uh, elite level athletes, frequently their genetics are so good that I, I'm not 100% sure if uh, it, it matters that much. It's, um, I, I, uh, I, I've known many an athlete that uh, uh, subsisted almost entirely on uh, Taco Bell. For example, and uh, <laughs> for sure, young, so, young athletes not on familiar diet. <laughs> oh, right, right. Um, so, so uh, taking taking that into it, um, I, I, I don't think that that's really uh, so much of a problem. Uh, I, maybe the largest benefit of a, a carbohydrate restricted ketogenic, or I, I mean, e- even paleo um, uh, flavored diets is that you almost don't have to worry about um, fueling nearly as much. And uh, what I mean by that is if you're less dependent on uh, carbohydrates or glycogen for a lot of what you're doing, granted, dependent on the intensity of whatever uh, sport or physical endeavor. Definitely. Um, uh, it, it really just doesn't seem to uh, matter very much. It's, um, uh, and when, whenever I was going through it, I uh, and in really hard training sessions, uh, I noticed that I almost never, and, and even to this day, I never really have to augment my diet much to uh, um, uh, compensate for what what I'm uh, doing in the gym or like outside running or whatever. It it feels like uh, adapting to a kind of more like a, a fat based oxidation or burning. Uh, gives you a, a certain level of like physiological robustness, where you're less dependent on your next meal, and it, at, at, at least that's what I've uh, noticed in myself, and it seems to be somewhat true in the athletes I've spoken with. Yeah, it definitely seems to on the you know power lifter, Olympic lifter, on the gym side of things in terms of being able to you know utilize different sort of fuel sources, and you know especially if you know, the amount of energy going in is similar with the fat intake. It definitely, it seems to be an, uh, an option for a lot of athletes, especially with those who are struggling with higher levels of, um, you know, poor blood glucose control or higher levels of inflammation. What's your thoughts on, you know, as we get into more team sport and more kind of heavily glycolytic type stuff, like, is there sort of a middle ground there in terms of, um, uh, fueling strategies rather than kind of like an all keto or low carb side or an all traditional, maybe higher carb side is, is, you know, with some of the demands of the team sports with, you know, is, is there some nuance in there or what are your, Oh yeah. You yeah. It, um, well, granted we could, uh, uh, certainly periodize, um, kind of like dietary nutritional, um, um, uh, things just, just like how we periodize training that say, in in the off season really cut the carbohydrates down pretty low to try to like, upregulate one's ability to uh, oxidize fat for fuel because well, well if uh, uh, stay in the off season in basketball or football if your um, uh, uh, if your performance doesn't matter so much in uh, the two days uh, then if we really adapt pretty hardcore to that those uh, uh, fatty acid transporters and uh, uh, ability to um, oxidize fats to increase in mitochondria it's not like those just go away overnight once we start introducing carbohydrates again. So I, 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 I do think that there is uh, uh, some ability uh, there. May, maybe one of the largest problems that I would see is, uh, well, uh, dealing with athletes is uh, probably akin to herding cats. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, getting them to stick to any of, um, uh, these dietary protocols, uh, would be, I, I, I see that as, uh, maybe the largest barrier. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, definitely when you have athletes that are, if they're not, are, you know, nowadays I think you'd have more people who, young athletes or athletes who would obviously have heard of these types of eating strategies and might be curious to try them versus like, as you mentioned, trying to kind of shoehorn this into an athlete who's not even, um, motivated to, to give it a go is, is, 
you know, can easily be a recipe for disaster in terms of compliance, in terms of energy intake, and, and the whole gamut, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Which it's uh, it, it is really a shame because the well, well so, so the athletes I've talked about that have subsisted entirely on Taco Bell or McDonald's or whatever. They their performance, you know, would would get better. Now, granted, kind of the diminishing returns effect, right? Um, it, it would get better if their digestion got better and they were less in, inflamed and they were less likely to injure themselves. Um, uh, but getting them to understand uh, uh, how much you have to do and kind of the trade off with uh, whatever social lives that they're living, you know. I, well, well, like I've I, I've been in school my whole life. I basically haven't had a social life, so it's uh, I, I don't really understand that too much. But uh, yeah. yeah Compliance for athletes, absolutely, especially if they're in the high school, university. There's obviously the social commitments and everything else, and that uh, mm -hmm. you know, as practitioners, we can have the best intentions of what we want to do or what we think is the best strategy, but it definitely has to marry up with the athlete and the environment. So that's a great, uh, great comment there. And if we shift gears here a little bit, Wes, and you know, talk about supplementation, some of your work in supplementation, and whether it relates to sort of ketogenic diets or not, are there certain whether it's novel supplements or supplements that you've worked on that uh, you think may provide some some marginal gains for for athletes out there. Well, um, gosh, I had I guess one of the things to caution people about uh, supplements uh, uh, initially is that if the supplements were truly amazing, they'd probably be illegal. So it's um, definitely uh, it's a small yeah. it's a small bucket, right? The nutrition, oh. the food is the, by far the biggest the biggest bucket to be focusing oh, on. Oh, de definitely. Well, nutrition, food, sleep, proper training, and diet. Well, I, I mean, there's been enough uh, research about uh, testosterone and nanthate, how that's considerably better than creatine. So it's... There you go. Um, yeah, right. Uh, I, I've been part of a lot of research on, uh, 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 say, whey protein or branched chain amino acids. Um, uh, really, our... Uh, our, our, our previous lab, they, they all like it quite a bit. And, uh, <clears throat> I, 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 I drink protein shakes sometimes myself. It's, uh, I, I've never really noticed much of benefit, um, from it, but I, I think in the bigger picture of say, uh, diet and, uh, just everything that you're putting into your body that I think people could really take away from this. A lot of times we get possessed by a certain ideas in our heads that, uh, say, after I lift weights, I need a protein shake, or after I go run, I need to replace uh, glycogen with whatever goo pack or whatever you're doing. And for me, one of the things that the ketogenic diet really pushed me to be willing to do was to be honest with how different foods made me feel. So I've had uh, uh, numerous friends that, um, uh, it, it, fr friends, and by that I mean people that worked in the research lab with me, um, nice. <laughs> right? Uh, th that uh, really enjoyed whey protein, yet they would uh, get a fair amount of uh, GI distress and um, uh, you know like flatulence or whatever from it. And I, I would always tell them that, uh, hey, like maybe that's your body telling you that you're lactose intolerant or you shouldn't be doing that or whatever. Um, uh, much the same to if somebody eats a bunch of carbohydrates and then gets really sleepy. If, um, if you have that kind of, if you just go super hypoglycemic, um, uh, it, it's. I get those signs as the feeling strategy is not sort of appropriate or optimal for that person, right? Oh, right, right. It, I don't. One of the strange things about um, uh, publishing in, uh, say, supplements or uh, 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 diet or nutrition, uh, it's weird to me how, uh, how how much people are kind of uh, zealots about certain things and uh, uh, argue a fair bit. I, because, I, well, really, I, I'm giving you a bunch of, like, uh, means and, like, standard deviations. So, like, just this is on average what happened to these people. Where really with, uh, like, diet or uh, supplementation, you can actually just figure it out for yourself. Like, just, hey, uh, like, don't eat carbs for a few weeks and just see what happens. You know, it's uh, and not, not granted if you're healthy enough to, like, uh, deal with, you know, kind of a stress like that. Um, uh Sure, some detective work, play around with it. If you need some support, bring somebody on to help you out in that journey, right? Oh, for sure, for sure. It's um, 
but I had, I, I've met numerous people that respond extremely well to vegan diets. I, uh, for, for the time whenever I was on a vegetarian diet, I, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I set a few records. It seemed to work pretty well for me. Um, but introducing meat again, back into my life by my digestion's gotten better. <laughs> so that's, uh, the, that, that's been nice. Um, yeah, it's amazing uh, how certain things sort of happen in conjunction when we do different dietary strategies, whether it's vegan or paleo or low carb or whatever it might be in terms of, you know, vegetable consumption increasing or processed food going down or oftentimes protein intake going up and some of these good themes that, uh, you know, these overarching principles that get shifted around, which is always, as you said, it, you know, you can have use different methods or strategies to kind of achieve that. And if we circle back to even the protein supplementation, I think that's one where oftentimes it's just convenient for folks, right? They can get a, a dose in, especially if it, you know, all things considered, it digests um, appropriately. Then all of a sudden it's sort of palatable, it goes down well. Um, what's your opinion there on, I know, you know, bars versus shakes there? Obviously, to make a bar taste of anything, we've got to put some more sugars, sweeteners, other things in there. Is that something that you've noticed with, with in your work or athletes, any kind of differences there or something that you oh. consume? I, yeah, the uh, well, uh, uh, some people just don't seem to respond very well to the uh, sugar alcohols in it. Um, uh, but the, I, there's a bunch of uh, 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 bars out there that do a bunch of like soluble corn fiber that s seem to not really cause any like GI distress. Like um, I, I, I don't know, I'm obviously not sponsored by them or anything, but like those those Quest bars, they seem to be uh, relatively good. Um, uh, I haven't met too many people who have many issues with um, uh, those. No, granted, I'm sure there are people that do. Um, uh, but I, I think I, I, I'm trying to remember. I, I, there was a study. I can't remember who the author was on it, but I believe the thermic effect of consuming a liquid protein shake was higher than that of um, th than of like consuming it in like a protein bar, um, uh, uh, l l like that version of it. Yep, I, for sure. Uh, so maybe if you're trying to uh, increase the thermic effect of food there to, I don't know, burn a few more calories or if it's um, if it's more satiating to you to uh, chew on it rather than um, suck it down, that I, I, I think a lot of that is uh, potentially personal preference and um, oh, what people like to do. I, I haven't noticed much. Um, and granted, I'm not... Uh, abundantly educated on that uh, literature either. So I, I'm sorry about that. No, no, no yeah. problem. Um, just obviously your personal take on that. But it, in terms of your work and your research at the moment, what are some of the things that are exciting for you, whether it's down this ketogenic route or other things that are kind of new on the table for you? Oh, gosh. Well, um, so uh, going uh, forward, I well, so I, I moved to Wisconsin and I don't have uh, exactly – uh, as much molecular uh, uh, potential as I did uh, whenever I was at Auburn. Uh, but my master's was actually kind of more tilted towards exercise psychology. So I've been getting more into um, personality and the motivations behind, uh, say, exercise or uh, dietary behavior. So one thing that I, I don't think many people are looking at whenever we say uh, prescribe or recommend uh, this exercise program or this dietary approach, um, we probably need to screen for what type of human being that we're even talking to to see if uh, they'd be open to it. Um, so uh, from the psychometrics, there's approximately uh, five or so uh, like uh, personality traits that we all are on, on a spectrum. And, uh, I, I'd like to figure out kind of almost on a mixing board, like how much of this personality trait and with this personality trait should we then recommend, say, a paleo idea um, or should we recommend, say, a vegan idea? Uh, because, well, I, I don't know how many uh, uh, vegans you've spoken with, but they all kind of have a common thread of personality that I've noticed. Um, and uh, – Quite similar for us, uh, say paleo folks as well. So I, I I'm pretty interested in that uh, going ahead. And now, now, granted, not physiology, um, but that's uh, that's been something that's been uh, moving to me that I don't think the uh, current state of science has really answered much, if at all, yet. 
Yeah, it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. I mean, I'm always amazed at uh, you know why certain athletes or clients will fully embrace a certain protocol or suggestion, even if it's just based by their friend or colleague or you know person in their family. Versus sometimes when they see a practitioner, and yeah, with this intricate balance between uh, you know when we have trust around a certain thing, we tend to adopt it, or even as practitioners, we tend to attract a certain type of person as well. And how much is that playing into how well we the outcomes that we have? Um, so the Really, really fascinating stuff there. Was be interested to see what uh, kind of um, things you, um, some of the findings you come out with on that. And of course, if we kind of round things up here, I want to respect your time. If we circle back to the you know, the ketogenic diets for resistance training and CrossFit, if somebody's listening in here, you know, what's a piece of advice that you would give that sort of recreational athlete on this topic of keto diets and CrossFit style training? Gosh, um, I stick it out for long enough. Don't, uh, don't, uh, I, I guess the biggest thing is, uh, feelings aren't facts. So you might feel like you're not going to do well or PR on, uh, whatever you're doing on that given day. Um, but if you stick it out, let the adaptation actually occur. It's, um, if, if you've been eating one way, getting used to oxidizing, uh, or, or burning carbohydrates forever, it's, uh, it might take more than a month for you to start feeling really awesome not doing that. So it, um, I, I guess it's not a super scientific thing that I'm saying, but uh, hold to it, stick it out, just and, and see what happens. I, I, I think is probably uh, that. That's probably the biggest thing that I would tell anybody who's trying something new is uh, do it for long enough to actually assess and, and also write things down or write down what your times are on different things and be somewhat quantitatively objective in it. Don't, don't just pay attention to, Oh, well, like say I have a headache today or, uh, whatever. Right. Um, I, I think that that could be, uh, uh, useful for most people to do. Absolutely. I've been pairing some performance metrics when, body composition is the goal and of course you know the study there your pilot study showing that obviously you being able to maintain these performance outputs as well as improving body composition is definitely um, some some keen insights there for folks and as you mentioned I think yeah we tend to see people who are struggling on more blood sugar dysfunction or more overweight um, will probably take a little bit longer to be uh, feeling better on this type of approach so your your recommendations there is a great one of you know stick it out make a plan and then and go forward and do some experimentation right yeah yeah no for sure it's uh yeah and i mean hey like like from from my research it's summertime now it's uh well, well take a trip to shred city why not you know <laughs> there you go there you go <laughs> fantastic Wes. well listen uh appreciate the great insights here where can people stay connected with you and keep up with all your fantastic work and research Oh gosh, that that's a good question. Uh, um, yeah, I'm not super active on. Uh, well, I, I don't have a Twitter or anything. Um, uh, oh, I, I guess the coolest thing would be if they just showed up in Wisconsin, ca came and said hi. You know, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> we'll put your research gate up, and then we'll definitely. Uh, well, yeah, we'll put your address in Wisconsin as well. They can come over and say hi. It's at the uh, at the university there, and uh, yeah, listen. Really appreciate you taking the time here, Wes. Um, Appreciate everyone else for tuning in as well. We'll definitely include all the links to the papers discussed here in the show notes at drbubs.com forward slash podcast. If you have any questions for Wes or want to leave a comment on today's 